Web of Lies. Chapter 8. Road to London. It had become obvious to everybody what the next stop was. They had planned to avoid the big cities, but that was when they were trying to avoid the public. Now, they could take any stretch with a lenient signalman. And they all agreed that the easiest route would take them through the biggest city of all. But Diesel was adamant. We are not going through London, said Diesel resolutely. I thought you were all about efficiency, cooed Thomas. It's the quickest route to Southampton, isn't it? How did we get so far off track? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because you dragged us all the way to Derby. We're much further east than we're supposed to be. And you claim you're not sentimental. I'm not, the Diesel sizzled. But he only half believed that himself. What's so bad about London anyway? And then Thomas made a face. Uh, besides all the self-important express engines and pencil-pushing politicians who keep sticking their noses in my island's business and the smog. I've worked at all the major stations in London and, regrettably, I have made enemies in every one. Even with no markings, the station masters have learned to recognize me on sight. I am hated the whole city over. Jeez, London too? Thomas was growing tired of rolling on eggshells to accommodate the Diesel's shattered reputation. It complicated things immensely. Maybe just, I don't know, say you're sorry? Diesel molded over, for all of five seconds. Or we could avoid London entirely. That would keep things simple. Simple? London is the only sensible route, insisted Thomas. It's where the LMS meets the Southern Railway. No such things, said Diesel abrasively. You know what I mean. Whatever you call them. Those railways ceased to exist years ago. The junction you are referring to is where the London Midland region of British Railways meets the southern region of British Railways. Do you end every sentence with British Railways? That's a bit clunky, don't you think, British Railways? Seems rather daft to me, British Railways. Stop. He clenched his eyes. Thomas relented. We won't spend long. We're just passing through. But no one ever just passes through London. It's far too large and sprawling for that. They were about to be consumed by it. As the duo chuffered along toward the great city, Thomas began to get giddy. He was a small-town boy himself. He had spent his first year of life in London, and that had been enough for him. Too easy to get lost in the crowd there. Country life suited him far better. But things were different now. He was a celebrity. People noticed him no matter where he went. And there were a lot of people in London. He began to grow excited. How about a song? He suggested gaily. Well, that sounds pleasant, agreed Marcel, as they heaved another shovelful into the great engine's belly. Maxine checked his gauges, as if to make sure he had the steam for such a performance. Have you got one picked out already, then? Of course! James isn't the only one who's well-versed in lyrics. And unlike him, I can actually sing. But that remained to be seen. Diesel groaned. Now hold on, this is not a unanimous decision. <laughs> Since when have you believed in democracy? Thomas chuckled and cleared his throat. They whooshed into one of the small towns that made up London's fuzzy borders. As the signalman had promised, the lights were all green for them. Passengers crowded toward the edge of the platform to see the unusual sight racing toward them. Upon realizing it was Thomas, they were just as bubbly as all the people that they had passed before. To hear a steam engine whoosh through a mainline station in the late 80s, well, that was a treat. But to hear him sing as he did it, now that was something else. With a wink and a whistle, he broke out into song. <clears throat> Up to mighty London came an Irish lad one day. All the streets were paved with gold and everyone was gay. Singing songs of Piccadilly, Strand and Leicester Square. Till Paddy got excited and he shouted to them there. It's a long way to Tipperary. Oh, it's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girls I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. 
It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. Oh, it's a long, He carried long on like this straight through two towns, and despite his volume, not a single noise complaint was filed. There was only one heckler in the Blue Engine's audience, but it was hard to see him behind all the black smoke and angry sparks. At last, Thomas cheerfully drew the tune to a close. My heart's right there. Oh, it's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. Whew. Thomas's driver and fireman erupted in cheers and applause. Though Maxine was mainly the one doing the hollering, Marcel's reaction amounted to more of a subdued golf clap but both were very enthusiastic all the same. Man, you guys are way more easygoing than my last crew, and he chuckled to himself, remembering. Dana would have plugged her ears. She'd let me through three red signals before three verses of Tipperary. Maxine just laughed. Well, maybe you were built on the wrong generation, Thomas. Seems like 1988 agrees with you. Diesel simply had to interject. He literally just sang a World War I marching song. You don't get more old-fashioned than that. Some things never go out of fashion, the tank engine grinned, though once again he knew Diesel would never agree. After basking in his praise a bit more, Thomas asked Diesel a question. Did you notice the change I made? Diesel was at a loss for both understanding and interest. He simply muttered, What? I tweaked the song. I added something. Yes. Diesel narrowed his eyes as if unraveling a ruse. This is just a more convoluted version of I Spy. Thomas, unfazed, explained himself proudly. I said girls instead of girl. Want to guess who the girls are? No, not really. I'm not going to stop asking until you do. Yeah. <sighs> who? Well, Annie and Clarabel, of course. That one was for them. Diesel didn't find it very endearing, and Thomas's own face fell quickly, too. He looked forlorn. I do miss them. A thought flicked across Diesel's head. Perhaps he should say something along the lines of we'll be home soon or not long now. But it was a wholly superfluous idea. He wasn't sure how it had even entered his mind. It served no practical purpose whatsoever. So he cleansed it from his mind and returned to contemplating more useful strategies. Still, Thomas's somberness gave Diesel a sort of uneasiness and the fact that he was even experiencing that uneasy feeling made him uneasier still. He suddenly wished that Thomas would start singing again, it would drown out these dreadful thoughts. But he didn't for some time. London was different than Thomas remembered. The last time he had been there was in the late 50s, when he and his friends had gone away on exhibition. That had been before the beaching acts. The car had made itself at home in London. That much was clear. Thomas and Diesel coasted into the city on a huge four-track main line, which took up no small plot of land. But the railway wasn't the only installment that took up masses and masses of real estate. Running alongside them in perfect symmetry for a solid ten miles, a massive multi-lane freeway traced the outline of the tracks. An inconceivably large number of cars buzzed and beeped along the lanes like a row of ants. Meanwhile, Thomas and Diesel had yet to pass another train on this stretch. Thomas found it rather concerning. Diesel was so repulsed, he couldn't so much as look in the direction of the road. The world had indeed changed. They had received a lot of excited looks and admiring shouts from the towns they'd passed thus far, but it was nothing compared to the big city. In many places, the road had grown over the railway. Thomas was used to the occasional crossing or road bridge back on Sodor, but here, it seemed as if every mile was punctuated by a robust stone overpass that carried cars and lorries across the railway tracks without stopping the flow of traffic. If that had been the intention, however, then it had not succeeded, because Thomas was stopping the flow of traffic by his mere presence. Cars would stop on the roads above just for their drivers to lean out the window and get a better look at the famous tank engine. Rubberneckers, Maxine said, shaking her head. But she did it with a flattered smile. Thomas had no clue what a rubbernecker was, but they were making him feel very special. Soon they had reached their first London signal box. 
It was no different from any of the other signal boxes, but it represented a milestone in the journey all the same. The crew dismounted and approached it. Thomas had noticed that they weren't parking him right by the box anymore, like they had early on in the trip. He couldn't overhear their conversations with the signalman anymore. He wondered if they didn't want him to be seen. Maybe it was easier to negotiate if they simply didn't bring their bright blue steam engine up at all. The general public was very fond of him, but railway administration seemed to vary by the town, and even by the yard. Maxine returned to her engine with a spring in her step. Good news! Signalman says there's a coal merchant who sells in bulk, and he's on our way. Diesel, ever the cynic, just had to ask, What's the bad news? There was, indeed, bad news. But Maxine knew better than to share it. Let's cross that bridge when we get there, she winked, and with almost perfect synchronization, her and Marcel swung up into their respective sides of the cab. Diesel knew every inch of London like the back of his buffers. It is for this reason that, as they made their way through complex webs of connecting lines, passing familiar streets, boroughs, industries, landmarks, that he began to grow more and more agitated. Peculiar. What is, said an oblivious Thomas, as he hooted to a gobsmacked man on a bike. The poor gentleman soon collided with an open car door. We're going west, Diesel said, half of his attention still on his own thoughts. Well, duh, chuckled Thomas. Southampton's southwest of here. Yes, but we're going through western London. And then he saw those famous canopies looming over the London skyline, one of the biggest stations in London, a truly great structure, a great western structure. They were one mile from Paddington Station. Diesel made the most horrendous screeching noise. When he started making smoke, they had no choice but to stop and look him over. Damn it! Hot boxes! Maxine cursed, slamming the panel shut and blowing on her hand. How many? asked Marcel. All six! replied Maxine in amazement. It's just a bloody station, Diesel. How can it make you this angry? Because it is the Panniers Station. Devious Diesel hissed with raw contempt, and he is the cause of all my woes. Thomas couldn't help but laugh. Tread carefully, tank engine. The tank engine tried to bring his laughter under control. <laughs> okay, okay. But Diesel, you're unbelievable. We've just crossed a whole country of people and engines you've offended. Surely Duck didn't accompany you for all of that. Diesel just growled as he realized he had to elaborate. Of course he didn't, but his confounded ideology did. I had a perfect success record. I revolutionized every yard I visited. And then his thin, sinister eyebrows fell darkly over his bitter eyes. Until Tidmouth. He made a fool of me. It was one prank. Hadn't you ever been pranked before? One grave look from Diesel told Thomas he hadn't. He reiterated, Do not drag me into Paddington Station. You will regret it. I'm quite tired of your threats, huffed Thomas. The coal merchant is on that side of town, and I'm not going to go hungry because you can't swallow a grudge. And with a definitive yank, Thomas jerked Diesel onward to Paddington, ignoring the screech as best he could. Thomas's best was not enough. When they trundled under the signal gantry into Paddington Station Yard, Diesel's screaming axles grew louder. When the station itself came into view, he quickly started to sound more like a megaphone being dragged across a chalkboard. He made such a fuss that a door burst open from the nearby engine sheds. The shedmaster raced out and called for them to stop. Hold up! I said hold up! Thomas stopped where he was and shut his eyes in annoyance, heaving a heavy breath. Yes, sir, said Marcel from the footplate, preparing for a difficult conversation. That engine is not up to code in the slightest. He fetched his spectacles from his shirt pocket and bent over to get a good look at the leaking axle boxes. He orbited the entire engine in that same hunched pose, growing more displeased by the moment. You will need to put him in the loco sidings, he insisted. We will have him looked out there. Maxine and Marcel just traded a glance and then reluctantly agreed. 
Before long, the points had been set for them, and they were making haste to the sheds. Thomas was shocked. All the shed master's focus had been placed squarely on diesel. He hadn't even remarked once about the bright blue steam engine from the 1910s who was coupled to him. Why would a great westerner, of all people, allow them to traverse these rails unpermitted? Thomas thought back. The first Sir Topham had had been a Swindon man. The great western had taught him everything he knew about engines and railways, and he had carried a love of the railway with him to his deathbed. He had had friends in Paddington. Maybe those associations were serving them, even now. It was anyone's guess, but Thomas wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Diesel, however, was less than grateful for the free service. I am beyond outrage, his axles screamed. I won't be serviced by great western men. I won't. Thomas just snickered. I thought you said the full railways didn't exist anymore. Diesel just fumed. He might have claimed to not believe in the big four, but the truth was obvious. He was an LMS engine in different colors, and his rivalry with the Great Western was older than Diesel's themselves. It was a loathing which had existed between red and green since the early days of the grouping. Whether he realized it or not, he was an extension of that bitter tradition. But Thomas, who had no allegiance to any railway beyond his Farquhar branch line, ignored those petty pleas and backed him squarely into an open berth in the engine shed. This is your last chance. Remove me from this place. But the driver cut in with annoyance. We can't take you anywhere when you're throwing a fit this big. We'll just have to go to the merchant without you. Hopefully you've gained some sense when we get back. And in an expression of firm agreement with their driver, Marcel uncoupled the diesel. We'll be back in an hour, promised Thomas, and they were off to place a very large order on the company card. Diesel watched Thomas trundle toward the mouth of the yard. He waited until he was totally out of sight, and then he snickered deviously. <laughs> Reverse psychology always works like a dream. His axle boxes stopped leaking. The grease ran into his bearings once more. He was oilier than ever. The station was really rather breathtaking. It had four huge canopies that slowly curved with the platforms, and each one was sized differently than the last. The great white semicircles changed from big to small, big to small, alternating with rhythm, like a waddle or a waltz. It was certainly worthy of postcards. Diesel had no doubt he'd inadvertently stolen a few tiny pictures of Paddington when he'd absconded with the mail train a few days back. Staring up at it, even Devious Diesel could not deny the majesty of Paddington Station. And he was going to ruin it. He could see more than just the station from his siding. He could see the offices that adjoined the engine shed he was sitting in. There were a few doors that led into the structure. Some were marked and some weren't. But only one of them was of interest to Diesel. He smiled slimily. It was the door to the engine driver's common room. Now he had only to wait. Sure enough, it wasn't long before a railway employee came wandering out. Diesel turned on the charm. Excuse me, sir, he oozed. I believe you're my driver this afternoon. The man stopped in his tracks and pondered. Can't be. Jim wouldn't be back with the engine yet. Oh, he was, lied Diesel. He was impressively quick today. The driver twiddled his jaw, trying to make sense of the situation. With some hesitation, he began his inspections. "'Well, you seem in order,' he said dreamily. "'Awfully grimy, though. I can't even see your number any more.' "'I am indeed due for a wash,' said Diesel sadly, mimicking the disposition of a certain old blue engine who was once desperate for a day out. "'Perhaps you can give me a wash when we're through.' If you perform well, said the driver firmly, and then he boarded the wrong diesel, none the wiser. A wash indeed. <laughs> diesel would never have dreamed of it. Diesel glided giddily into the station, not a single squeak in his suspension. A grungy-looking Class 45 was just decoupling from his train. He spared the diesel a slightly hungover look before rumbling away to the sheds. 
Shunter honed in on the unfortunate line of coaches. They were much more streamlined than the ones he'd grown accustomed to on Sodor. Their jet-plane-like windows and sleek steel bodies radiated modernity. Maybe he would have told them that, if he had had the decency to compliment them. But this wasn't Edward. This was Devious Diesel. He gave them a bump. Oh, cried one. Those are unfamiliar buffers. He jerked them backward hastily, and they all squealed. Diesel just cackled. Easy, old boy, called the driver. They are trucks. But that constructive criticism would do no good. Diesel wasn't listening. With a precise and purposeful tug, Diesel pulled the lead coach's front bogey off the tracks. She dragged along the sleepers with a mournful thud a thud a thud a thud a thud a thud a thud Bother, shouted the driver. We'll have to wait for a crane. Let's just tuck them back onto Platform 7, then, out of the way. So Diesel tucked them back in. But not far enough. That had always been the plan. Now, the lead carriage was blocking the main switch by just a hair. Enough that an oncoming train wouldn't notice it, but not enough that it would clear it. He turned his attention to some third-class carriages on Platform 2, which were looking rather sleepy after a strenuous run. They didn't have the same stamina that the express coaches were known for. Diesel woke them with a violent whirr of his wheels. This way, dears, he implored them slimily. Despite their protests, he hurled them across the yard and pulled them down the wrong siding before the signalman had time to set the points. The driver's knuckles had turned white. The throttle was jammed hard in reverse. Until it wasn't, and Diesel came to a total halt. He and the coaches were sitting on a major entry line, one of the only ones that led back to the carriage yards. "'What are you playing at?' called a very groggy coach. "'We're on the wrong line. We're meant to go to Platform 5 next.' "'On the contrary, my dear,' insisted the Diesel. "'You are right where I want you.' A horn blared in the distance, and a dull gray Class 52 rattled tiredly past. He was headed for Platform 8. As he rounded the bend and flew over the main switches that granted entry to every platform of the station, he grew closer and closer to the head of Diesel's train. Diesel had barely left any clearance." "'Jiminy Christmas!' cried the big diesel, and he slammed on his brakes. The rear coach shut her eyes tight. Both engine and carriage were sure they were going to collide. But they didn't, because that had never been the plan. Diesel's face split into a huge grin as his true intentions came to pass. The sudden stop had jarred every coach in the train. They ran into each other like dominoes, and each one derailed, hurtling this way and that. It was a miracle they stayed upright at all.' The whole yard was thrown into a panic, but there was worse to come. Unable to stop in time, the gray diesel was horrified when he spotted diesel's second booby trap, the train he had shunted earlier, its derailed bogey hanging just far enough out of Platform 7 that there was no way the diesel could get past without a disaster. He clipped it with incredible force. The coach's buffer was torn clean off and went flying, crashing through the station's glass roof and carrying on into the sky. The diesel found himself tipping dangerously to the left, and when gravity overtook him at last, he tipped over and skated across the adjoining track on his side. His train, still dancing painfully along the sleepers, slowly dragged to a halt. (sighs) When everything was finally out of motion, the true scale of the calamity became apparent. Devious Diesel had successfully blocked every platform of Paddington Station. It was the engine, sir, I swear! The driver was babbling like a child, dabbing his eyes and his forehead as he tried to explain the madness that had transpired to the station master. Get a hold of yourself, man! Snap the man in charge! You can't go blaming the machinery! This is on your hands! There will be a thorough investigation! Just then, one of the porters called out to him from his office, and the station master flew off to attend to the crisis. It was going to be a very long evening shift. Diesel watched it all from a random entry line. It didn't matter where they parked anything now. The station yard was more of a war zone than a track plan. It had been an hour. Thomas the tank engine pulled up behind him in shock. "'What did you do?' gasped the tank engine in horror." Diesel faced away from him. Thomas could not see the shit-eating grin spread across his callous grill. Me, my dear engine, I would never. 
Maxine just shook her head, overwhelmed by the disaster before her. You're in the way. They need to get a breakdown train through here. But even once they dragged Diesel out of the yard, the coaches he had been shunting still blocked one of the major access routes. That was part of his genius. As they shuttled out of the yard, they spotted the station master pacing fiercely out of the station and toward the signal box. He was angrily muttering something about a severed power line and all the bloody phones being down. The telephone in the box was ringing off the hook, now the only means of communication to the outside world. When he answered it, they could just barely hear him inside as they passed by. You're serious? You're actually willing to send him? The other side of the line mumbled and murmured inaudibly. <laughs> He's insisting, you say. More mumbling. <laughs> We, we can't do that. We, we don't have facilities to support a steam engine, even for a short while. A very persuasive mumble followed this. It was a low, booming voice. That was clear even through the phone. The station master wavered. Well, uh, we do have quite a few heritage railways not far off. Maybe one of them could spare some coal. Thomas slowed down, listening. Good Lord! He actually called to check in. Diesel's face lit up. They both knew who was on the other end and which engine was begging to be sent to London. It must be headline news, Diesel sneered and took another look at the travesty he had created in the yards. The station master was rubbing his bald head so hard, Thomas thought it might come to a polish. He was actually considering it. No, sir, we've never had anyone better. All of our veterans still talk about him. Thomas had to gawk. He couldn't help but be impressed. But rules are rules. No steam engines in revenue-earning service these days. Not even your Montague. <laughs>